Now we're going to look at the prophecies from Nostradamus and Bishop uh, Malachi or Malachi. Most people say Malachi. Um, here's a fascinating series of prophecies and when it comes to getting a timeline and trying to understand about when the timing would be, these really will help us sense that the time is near. Um, Nostradamus, he was famous long before he wrote his prophecies. He was famous as a physician who helped cure the Black Plague. He was very much in demand. In the Middle Ages, the Black Plague, most physicians went to the house covered in black garments to shield themselves from the great fear of catching this death. Now you and I know that the Black Plague was carried by fleas on rats and that to be bit by the flea was to have it uh, enter your bloodstream and you would eventually become fatally ill from it. When Nostradamus came to one of these houses, he didn't change his clothes. He wore normal clothes. He went into the house and he made everyone in that family clean the house completely, take all the clothes and bed linens out back, wash them, and hang them in the sun. Now you know what would be happening with the fleas. He would clean the entire house, so you know what, where the rats would go to the neighbors. <laughs> and then he made little balls, pill-like, but a little larger than we're used to, of rose hips and other herbs. And the, he would not only make the ill person eat it, he would make the rest of the family eat it. Because it was believed that once a person became ill in the house, everyone was going to get the disease and die. This was so bad that every morning in these towns, wagons would go down the streets and everyone would put their dead in the wagons, those that had died during the night. And they would take them out to a mass grave. It was an overwhelming plague. And yet Nostradamus seemed to be able to cure those who called on his aid. And he did it with very basic activities and this little rose hip vitamin C packed pill of his. He was also famous as a writer. He wrote the most popular annual almanac in Paris. Every year everybody wanted Nostradamus's uh, almanac. As he got older though, he withdrew and he started writing these books. He called them centuries. Each book was called Century, Century One, Century Two. And in the first book, he described, secretly he described how he did it. But let me explain why he had to write so cryptically. This was the time of the Inquisition. So he had to be very careful not to be doing anything spooky or of the devil that might attract the attention of the Inquisitor and all of his forces. The other problem Nostradamus had was his parents were converted Jews, so they were always suspect by the Christian powers. Um, even so, he was a Christian. He followed Christian patterns and traditions. But the Inquisitors knew his parents had been Jews. And so he always had a little danger there. So he wrote in quatrains very cryptically so you couldn't be sure exactly what he said. Here's a quatrain from Century One and it is the first quatrain in the first book. Seated alone in secret study, alone at rest on the brazen tripod. A slender flame leaks out of the solitude, making possible that which would otherwise have been in vain. So he was doing something 
on a tripod with a little candle in the darkness that would cause him to go into an altered state. In another quatrain, the second one in the first book, he writes, the wand in his hand is placed between the branches. A wand. He moistens the hem of his garment and his foot. This is very similar to what the high priest in Israel was doing. Fear arises and a voice sets him trembling in his robes in divine splendor. A God sits nearby. Somehow he was connecting with the godly forces. The it in the second line of the first quatrain, many believe, was either a black mirror, which is a black concave piece of polished metal, or it was a specially prepared tray of water in which mercury, you know, in the a little... Uh, thermometer tube, that mercury, would float. And you know mercury is a very mercurious, strange little uh, quality to it. And he would stare into these and slip into an altered state. And he would start to see visions. And he would record them. But he would record them in cryptic ways so he could be safe from the Inquisitor. He wrote to his son Cesar that the visions came to him in the manner of, quote, imaginative impressions. It's fascinating because Edgar Cayce uh, suggests that one of the ways for us to expand consciousness is to use our imaginative forces. And here's Nostradamus using imaginative impressions revealed by God Almighty. So see how he was still very spiritual, but he was opening up to a mystical, metaphysical means of getting insight, guidance, and prophecy. <laughs> one of his biggest troubles happened that one of his first prophecies was fulfilled while he was alive right there in Paris. It's the first book, and it's the 35th quatrain in that first book. And he simply wrote it this way, cryptically enough to protect himself for a while until the events happened and everybody realized what it meant. The young lion will overcome the old one in single combat on a field of battle. A golden cage, his eyes will be pierced. In a golden cage, his eyes will be pierced. Two wounds as one, followed by a cruel death. What happened was, Henry II, King of France, loved to joust. Every weekend he had joust matches, just like the NFL. Everybody came. It was entertainment, great fun. Also, Henry did not like knights to withdraw when they came up to challenge him. He wanted them to joust with him. He insisted. Well, from Scotland... A young Scottish captain came over to do the joust one day. Interestingly, Henry's symbol was a lion. And the Scotsman, younger than King Henry, also had the symbol of the lion. The young lion will overcome the old lion, see? In single combat on a field of battle. When the two charged at each other with their lances out, as they hit the shields, the lance is splintered and one of the biggest splinters went right through the eye hole of King Henry II's helmet, pierced his eye and his brain, two wounds as one, and it, four days of cruel, painful death. But the other thing was Henry didn't wear normal helmets. He liked a golden helmet. He was the only guy wearing a golden helmet. In a golden cage, his eyes will be pierced, two wounds as one, followed by a cruel death. When everyone realized they had read this very scene that occurred before them in Nostradamus's book, they rose up to kill Nostradamus because he had to be possessed of the devil. The queen and her uh, men got between them and the group, and she yelled out, 
Who killed King Henry? Nostradamus or the Scotsman? Everybody went, oh yeah, they turned around and they ran after the Scotsman. He ran to the harbor, jumped on the boat and sailed back to Scotland and got away. She had her men take Nostradamus into the palace and protect him for life. Protect him from the Inquisitor, who was all ready to claim that the devil had taken hold of him, and from the people who were scared to death. How could he have seen this event so perfectly, so long before it happened. It was profound. Now he was infamous. And she had to protect him, and she did. Some of the amazing things that he did, now remember, he's in the 1550s, and he predicts in his imaginative impressions the Emperor Napoleon, who doesn't come till the 1700s, 1800s an emperor will be born near Italy. Not in Italy, near Italy. Corsica is an island off the coast of Italy. This is an emperor of France, born near Italy. And he writes it just like that. Unlikely. Who will cost the empire dearly. And boy did Napoleon cost France dearly. It will be said when his allies are seen that he is less a prince than a butcher. Foreshadowing Napoleon, there were several more quatrains about Napoleon that really had unique specifics about Napoleon. So clearly Nostradamus was seeing this future emperor and the trouble he would bring. He also predicted Hitler. He called him Hister or Ister. Now, Hitler's in the 18-1900s. Nostradamus is sitting in his quiet little dark room in the 1500s in a spot not too far removed from Venice. Well, that might be the Brenner Pass. The two strongest of Asia and Africa. The two strongest of Asia and Africa. Looking in hindsight, these might have been, he was seeing Japan, the powerful of Asia, and Italy, who ruled Ethiopia and North Africa, the two strongest, will be said to come together with the Rhine, the Rhine River, Germany, and Ister, which we believe uh, is his... Uh, imaginative vision of the name of this guy. He also said Hister in uh, second century 24th quatrain, Hister. So he was picking up the H, but he wasn't quite getting the middle part there. Weeping at Malta and the Ligurian coast. Italy annexed Ethiopia, making it the strongest power in Africa. Malta and Genoa, the Ligurian coast, were both bombarded heavily during the war. Malta by the Axis powers and Genoa by the Allies. So he, it appears, he's, these are so specific, it appears that he truly was seeing a future great war and a future um, imperialistic ruler, leader, and three nations that were going to become the Axis powers and the devastation that was going to happen to lands near where he lived. He did miss September the 11th, 2001, but he missed it by 27 months. Now, since he's looking at it in 1550, I'm willing to give him a little miss on the date, but he starts the quatrain out in the year 1999 and seven months which would be July. Now, many people have written me and told me, oh, he was using a different calendar, but I checked on that. He was using virtually the same calendar we use. So he saw in his little vision 1999. Yet it didn't really happen until 2001 and the seventh month, but it didn't happen until the ninth month. From the sky, from the sky, he sees this, will come the king of terror, I mean, terrorism, 
and all is a new concept. We use those terms. He used the king of terror will come from the sky to resuscitate the king of the Mongols. Now you might not know how to associate this, the king of the Mongols, but Afghanistan was in his time all the Mongol hordes realm from Mongolia all through Afghanistan. This is also the land of Nod, east of Eden, to which Cain was banished. Do you recall when God engages Cain about killing Abel? And Cain says, you know, I won't be safe anywhere. And he says, I'll put a mark on you, the Mongol spot, and I will send you to a land east of Eden, the land of Nod. Cain's body is buried south of Kabul, Afghanistan. This would have been to Nostradamus, the land of the Mongols, and from out of Afghanistan, the king of terror would come and attack from the sky. Before and after Mars, the god of war, will reign happily. War will be before this event and war will be after this event. And it sure looks like his 10th book, Quatrain 72, was looking at or near this event that occurred in September 11th, 2001. When is the end? Nostradamus wrote a letter to his son Cesar. And in that letter he said that his prophecies are from his time to the year 3,797 A.D. Very clearly, 3,797 A.D. So you and I can just say that if we think he's pretty good seer, there's a lot of time left to go through here. And the next two ages, the sixth and seventh ages, we can kind of see there's a few thousand years involved in them be, uh, coming to fulfillment. Now, if we tie Nostradamus into the prophecies of the Bishop Malachi, we really get a timeline that works for us. Malachi was long before, 500 years before Nostradamus. Um, he was the bishop in Ireland. And um, in 1138, 1138, he was visiting the Vatican. While there, there, he fell into a deep trance during which he saw the reigning pontiff and the line of succession of 112 popes, followed by the final fall of the Church of Rome. When he awoke, he wrote a complete manuscript on the vision, giving each pope a Latin motto or phrase. The manuscript was sent to the Vatican after Malachi's passing, where it was stored in secret archives until 1590. 1590, it was held secret. So Nostradamus couldn't have had this. I just want you to be aware of that. After which it was made public, after 1590. This was long after Nostradamus' death in 1566. And yet, Nostradamus' quatrains speak to Malachi's papal prophecies here of the line of the popes. Now I'm just going to take a few of the most recent popes to show you how accurate Malachi is. Um, Benedict the XV, he called him religio de populata, which literally means depopulation of religion. And he reigned during World War I when it seemed like all religion fell to nationalism and everybody was killing one another over their nationalistic views. Um, Pius XII he called Pastor Angelicus, angelic pastor of the church. I interviewed a lot of Catholic women on this and, and they told me they thought Pius XII was a very... Um, uh, holy person of an angelic spirit. And so that seemed to fit well. Then came John the 23rd, pastor at Nauta, which literally means shepherd and navigator. And he was the Archbishop of Venice and had the symbol of uh, seafaring uh, navigation. So it seemed like, wow, 
uh, you got to understand in 1138, um, 800 years before this pope, he sees this pope and he sees them in sequence. Is it possible that the whole journey is laid out so clearly and we're walking through it and that someone in an altered state could tap in and see down the road? It, it's just so hard to believe he could nail that pope. The next one he calls Floris Florum, which means flower of flowers. And Paul VI took a floral coat of arms as his symbol. And now you might say, well, uh, Paul knew that prophecy and tried to make it work. Well, maybe, but uh, look at some of these others. John Paul I. He was the shortest reign of a pope from August 26th to September 28th. He called him De Mediate Lune, which means something like the middle or half of the moon, a very short period of time. He was only 66 and in pretty good health when he suddenly and unexpectedly died. Now, in, uh, this was in 78. A book was written by... Um, the uh, homicide detective in Rome who was called to the Vatican that night because someone had died. Now, normally the process was you would go to the Vatican, view the body, and sign the death certificate, and that was all there was. There were a lot of old men up in the Vatican, so it was not an uncommon call. This particular night, though, when the uh, homicide detective arrived at the Vatican, uh, he was told that the Pope had died, and he was shocked because he was so young, he had just been elected, and he seemed in good health, and he said, well, this is amazing, this is a terrible tragedy. Uh, all I gotta do is see the body and I'll sign the death certificate. And the cardinal said, we cremated the body. He said, that's against the law. We know, but we're changing the Vatican law to allow for cremation of a pope. And he said, his whole, all of his homicide detective skills came to the surface. He whipped out his notepad and started noting inconsistencies. Now he was suspicious. And uh, one of the cardinals, Violat, he really believed this guy couldn't get his story straight. Something's off here. And for them to cremate the Pope was against the rules. Why would they even do it unless they were trying to hide something? So he was very suspicious. Look at this quatrain written by Nostradamus 500 years before. When the sepulcher of the great Roman is found, the day after will be elected a pope by his senate, the senate of cardinals. He will not be approved. Poisoned is his blood by the sacred chalice. Poisoning. Here's another quatrain. Four, number 11. He who will govern the great cape, the Pope, will be led to take action when John Paul I was elected Pope. In his first talk, he said, I will receive the women's delegation from the United States. Well, that wasn't too good to the cardinals because they were all about women's role in the church. And the second thing he said, which was even worse, I will investigate the Vatican Bank for laundering mafia money. That was it. He wasn't going to see too many more days. That was his action. He will be led to take action. The 12 red ones, the cardinals, will come to spoil the cover. Under murder, murder will come to be done. We think that this last line was that he was poisoned, that was murder. Then they cremated him against the law. That was a second murder. Under murder, murder will come to be done. Amazing. Now, this whole situation was so bizarre that the very next pope they elected was not out of the uh, political core, but he was from Poland. And for sure Malachi must have missed that cardinal being elected. But when you look at what Malachi called him, John Paul II, yes, the cardinal took the name of the pope that had just died and added the second to it. Malachi called him 
de, la, de labore solis, the labor of the sun. Now this cardinal was from Poland and he had worked with the labor unions and they were against the Soviet control. So he already had the Soviets against him and he comes out of the labor unions in Poland and hundreds of years earlier, Malachi says he will be the labor of the sun. Two attempts were made on John Paul II's life, one by the Soviets hiring a Turkish assassin and that when uh, the Pope was riding around in his car in uh, St. Peter's Square and as he was coming toward the assassin, he saw a little girl with a Fatima medal on and he bent over to touch her medal and the gun went off and the bullet entered him but did not kill him. If he had been standing straight up, it might have, but he bent over. Then he told the doctors, I want that bullet. When you get that out, give it to me. Then he went to Fatima, Portugal and put the bullet in uh, the crown of the statue of Our Lady of Fatima. The other assassination was made by a monk while in Portugal. Here's the quatrain coming from the 10th book, 65th quatrain. O great Rome, your ruin comes close, not of your walls, but of your blood and substance. The sharp one of letters, an educated monk, highly educated, the sharp one of letters will be a horrible notch pointed steel up his sleeve, ready to wound. And what happened was John Paul II was coming down a line, a double line of priests and bishops and uh, dignitaries of the church, blessing them. You know how he would go down like that. And this monk had a knife up his sleeve. And as John Paul II approached, he jumped out to kill him, but only wounded him, and they stopped it. And he lived through it. John Paul II felt like both times he was to be killed and Our Lady protected him. He felt the Lady of Fatima had an intimate uh, emotional connection with her that she was watching over him and had protected him from the bullet wound of the Soviet assassin and from the <clears throat> uh, knife. But here are, is Nostradamus seeing these things hundreds of years ahead and putting them together. Okay, believe it or not, Malachi's lineup ends in our time. There are only two more popes according to this great prophecy that began in 1138. The next pope after John Paul II was supposed to be Gloria Alave, the glory of the olive. Now all of us, including me, thought it was the Archbishop of Paris who's a converted Jew because the olive is the symbol of the Jews and the glory of the olive would be the greatest leader. But um, the cardinal that was elected was Ratzinger from Germany. And we thought, well, there's nothing to connect him here. Malachi must have missed until the cardinal took the papal name of Benedict. And then everybody was stunned because the Benedictines have a group called the Olivetans who have this uh, association with the Mount of Olives. And therefore the highest ranking among them would be the glory of the Olivetans, of the Olives, and that would be Benedict, the Pope Benedict. And when he took that name of Benedict the 16th, everyone realized Malachi's prophecy came again. Now, I know you can say Ratzinger knew the prophecy and probably picked that name for that, but I don't think so. Um, it's more associated with his own spiritual growth and all. I think it's integrated there. And he himself had a connection with Benedict um, and the, the line of the Benedict Popes, the 15th, and now he's the 16th. This is amazing connection with Malachi. Now, after Gloria Olive is to come Petrus Romanus, and that's the last pope. It literally means Peter of Rome. Everyone feels the implication that Malachi saw 
is the return of the first pope to be the last pope. Now this isn't unheard of because in Christendom and Judaism, um, Elijah was supposed to come before the Messiah. And of course, you know, Jesus told his disciples, Elijah did come before the Messiah. It was John the Baptist, and they did not know who it was, and they did with him what they wanted. So the idea that a soul or spirit can return with a spiritual mission is in the historic concepts of these religions. Is it possible that Malachi really was seeing the return of the spirit of Peter of Rome, the first pope? Um, now, you know Peter was uh, executed by the Romans, so he really wasn't the pope at the time. Uh, but the church saw that Jesus' comments to Peter made him the, uh, the established rock of the church, the first uh, leader of the church, and so they considered him the first pope. Pope Benedict XVI is an older man. Uh, our ARE group on our tours went over there and met with him and saw him and uh, were blessed by him. Um, you know, if he's normal health, he's going to live a normal life, then we're going to see him pass in the future here, and then comes the last pope. And, uh, if it is the spirit of Peter as the spirit of Elijah, that'll be very interesting to see. Um, the one thing you can take from this, no matter how it unfolds, is that we are very close to the end of Bishop Malachi's prophecies. That means there's a change coming in the Church of Rome, a change coming that might also be part of a change into a new age, into an age of a different arrangement for spirituality. Very interesting.